Hi, I'm James, and today I am taking a look at this, which is the HP MV X360 AY 0008 NA convertible laptop. Now, I have already posted a first impressions piece on this machine, uh, which you can find if you click the link that should be in the top corner or in the description, uh, looking at some aspects of the laptop. And before I start it, I just want to say First of all, thank you for watching, and um, do be sure to like this video if you've found it, if you find it useful, um, and ask any questions in the comments because those kind of interactions really do help us. Uh, I'm not going to try and sell you razor blades or underpants or a Patreon or anything like that, um, but if you can do that to help our channel, that would be really useful and help us to do more of these in the future. So moving on to the laptop, this is HP's latest 2020 edition of the MV X360 design that they have been using for a number of years um, and it is of interest to me particularly because it is the Ryzen 5 4500U based machine and I have previously been running this which is one of the older uh, 8th generation Core i5 15 inch models and was interested primarily in trying the Ryzen uh, Renoir APU, but also in getting a smaller, bit lighter laptop for uh, general use, particularly as I'm using things more on the move these days, and the 15 inch machine is quite heavy for those kinds of uses. So looking at the machine itself, obviously it is a 13 inch design. Uh, HP have done a good job in slimming down bezels around the screen compared to some of the earlier generations, and certainly compared to the 15 inch that I have here. The chassis itself is an all metal design, I believe it's aluminium, and it comes in at about 1.3 kilograms, so um, not the lightest laptop you will find uh, because there is quite a big battery in there, but certainly a lot slimmer, a lot lighter than the 15 inch machine I had before. This makes it a good option for if you're on the move and travelling, uh, and is just generally less cumbersome than the larger machine. Visually, I really like the nightfall black finish that this machine has. Um, the only concern I do have, obviously it shows, compared to the silver machine here, it does show up fingerprints a bit more on the metal, and I do have some slight concerns that this darker finish, um, because I believe it's aluminium underneath, any scratches may start to show through silver as the item gets older, uh, if you take any of that coating off, but certainly as new I think it looks really good, uh, especially when you clean it up from the fingerprint marks and things like that. I'm also a fan of the more minimalist HP logo that you get on the MV and Spectre ranges uh, compared to their more traditional fare where you get this big round very clearly HP logo it differentiates these more premium laptops from their more basic models. Overall the fit and finish of the machine is nice. Uh, the hinges and the weighting used to open them I believe is quite well judged. It's, uh, it's easy enough if you have the laptop say closed on a surface to open it up with just one hand and it's until you get past sort of 90 degrees it's not going to lift the base. If you want to convert it all the way round then with those hinges as they open you'll need a second hand to keep turning it round but once you're going past flat you need that anyway to lift and turn it. The weighting of uh, the base of the unit is quite nice as well, so even if you're using it as a touch screen, you aren't, you know, you need to apply quite a bit of force and then you'll start moving the screen before you're actually lifting the base up. So it's not like if you're using it on your lap and you touch the screen, you're going to topple it off onto the floor. I think they've got the sort of balance of weight in the base and the screen of the laptop about right. Uh, certainly more so than if you're using something like a Surface where it can feel quite easy to tip that backwards off the stand due to the amount of weight, weight in the screen portion of the machine. So I think they've done a good job at balancing that there. And when it comes to convertible laptops, these folding two-in-ones are really my preferred choice. I'm not a big fan of where you get the detachable designs like a Surface Pro uh, or some of the other ones where the screens flip around or twist. Uh, I tend to feel that this is the best option for that. In terms of long-term durability of the hinge and screen assembly, obviously I can't uh, comment on that. I've only had the machine a couple of weeks. However, the 15-inch machine I have here is around two and a half years old. 
uh, and has had no issues with regards to reliability or durability so hopefully that will be the case for this as well. One thing that I am not a particular fan of is these USB ports on the machine which hinge down. I um, commented on these in my initial impressions video. The way they work you insert the USB stick and pull this base bit down which means you always end up having to angle your USB stick down to insert it and then press in to open the port and I'm not a particular fan of this um, if you've got the particularly like a thicker USB stick like this um, it means if you've got the laptop on a surface you're going to have to lift it up to get the USB stick in um, and also because of the thickness of the laptop is quite low uh, with a device like this you end up you can't sit it flat on the desk as the USB stick will actually lift it up um, it's obviously not the end of the world but you do end up with some concerns about the durability of this long term if you're using USB devices a lot it's not it's not my favorite design looking on the other side and we have a USB-C port now the laptop comes with a, a USB-C to HDMI 2 adapter which you can use to plug into this uh, for up to 4K 60Hz output and that's okay by me um, to be honest where we're going to be using this laptop I will probably get a USB-C hub to provide uh, the output to an external monitor and also connection for peripherals via USB and connecting USB sticks um, Given the limitations of the USB ports and that hinging mechanism I'd have quite liked to have seen a second USB-C port um, Particularly as you know increasingly more devices are beginning to use that and just I don't feel those USB-A ports are the nicest to use so it would have perhaps been nice to have two USB-C just to give you a bit more flexibility in that. While I'm not the biggest fan of touchscreen laptops, I do overall like this form factor. Um, it works well as a clamshell laptop in general use, and if you're wanting to use it for viewing content, folding it round like this um, is pretty nice. Uh, if you know if you're sat in less uh, you know spacious area, obviously not at the moment. But if you're sat, say, on a train or plane, being able to fold it around like this and put it on a seat back table without, rather than having the screen pressed up against the, tape, the chair in front, having it this way around, you're less likely to have damage caused to it if someone, say, reclines on an airplane seat um, because it's not pushed right under it and it gives you a bit more space, brings the screen closer to you. So it does have its uses, even if it's not my preferred way of using the laptop. And some people will find utility with this as a tablet. Again, being able to fold it round, keyboard locks out, and use it as a touchscreen tablet does work reasonably well. Windows 10 isn't the best touch operating system, but using this laptop with its 13-inch screen is certainly a lot nicer than on the 15-inch MV, which is just really too big, too heavy to use as a tablet for any length of time. Finally, and as with the 15 inch laptop, the speakers are B&O branded, um, they're fairly standard laptop speaker affair to be honest, they come out through these grills on the base of the laptop on either side, so stereo speakers of course, um, and they kind of project down from this angle section and bounce back off the surface, or if you have the machine open in that sort of uh, folded back position then they'll be projecting upwards. They sound alright, they're obviously limited by the size of the speaker unit themselves. Um, I am not the biggest audiophile in the world, um, but I, I didn't pick any fault with them, but they didn't sound spectacular to me either. They do the job, as does the, uh, the microphone and so on. Now, as I've already said, one of the main draws to this laptop for me was the opportunity to try out the AMD Ryzen 5 4500U uh, Renoir based APU. This is one of the new 7 nanometer chips and combines 6 Zen 2 based cores running at a base clock of 2.3 GHz and boosting up to a maximum of 4 GHz with 6 AMD Radeon GCN 5th generation graphics cores. Compared to the previous generation Ryzen 5 3500U this is both an increase in cores and clock speed, uh, base clock and boost clock go up, 
um, and you have the later Zen 2 rather than Zen Plus microarchitecture underpinning that. Um, but a decrease in the number of graphical cores from 8 to 6. Uh, this is compensated somewhat because in theory being the same type of graphics core uh, reducing the number of them you should be losing performance uh, but they have also at the same time uh, compensated by increasing the GPU clock speed uh, from 1.2 to 1.5 gigahertz and they have also increased the supported or the officially supported uh, system memory speed from DDR4 2400 to DDR4 3200 uh, this combined with the better power efficiency of the 7 nanometer TMSC process should see the 4500U coming out ahead uh, in most scenarios. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to compare the graphical performance of the 3500U and the 4500U. Uh, I don't own a 3500U system. I was able to borrow one very quickly, but only to run a Cinebench R15 test on it, which saw the 4500U come out 33% faster on CPU performance, as uh, I do have a separate video looking at that, uh, but I will overlay that here as well, so uh, showing some of the details of single and multi-threaded performance. I also have a Intel Ice Lake base laptop, which is the Core i5 1035G4, and with that things were even more impressive to be honest. Um, there is a similar advantage in Cinebench R15, uh, but when looking at gaming performance, I again, I can overlay here, have tested GTA 5 on that and running identical settings across both machines, there was a 83% performance advantage for the Radeon graphics in the Ryzen R5 4500U versus the Iris Plus G4 graphics in the Core i5 1035G4. Um, Put simply for me, these Renoir chips are the new benchmark in mobile processors, certainly at the, this sort of power consumption and ignoring things with you know, discrete graphics. Um, if you're looking for a slim and light machine like this, they are probably going to be my go-to, uh, at least until Intel come along with Tiger Lake and their next generation of 11th generation parts, where they may start to pull back competitive landscape a bit more. Um, this laptop also is available with the 4700U and that should offer even more impressive performance with the 8 CPU cores available to it and an increase in the graphical power as well with additional graphics cores. Elsewhere, and I'd kind of say the specification is fairly run of the mill, maybe a little bit disappointing. Um, the fact this comes with 8 gigabytes of memory, uh, like again DDR4 3200, uh, is a definite weak point and it cannot be upgraded. Um, again, I have a video taking a look at this machine with the back removed, I'll show a picture here. Uh, and the memory is soldered down, there is no DIMM slots in this machine, so what you buy it with is what you will have for the life cycle of this machine for you. Uh, on a more positive note, again, the laptop comes with 256GB SSD and at the price point that isn't too bad, perhaps a little stingy. It's a PCI3 uh, times 2 device, not a times 4 device, um, and it can only read around 1.5 gigabytes a second. Now, there are positives and negatives to that. Obviously, um, when it comes to battery life, a faster SSD may end up drawing more power, decreasing battery life, and so on. Um, but at the price point that this machine is at, I would probably have liked to have seen either a higher capacity or faster SSD included in there. That feels like a fairly, you know, a fairly low cost drive uh, for the, you know, the price point and build and specification of the machine otherwise. Uh, both these issues are addressed with the, I think it is the, uh, the AY0009 NA model, which features the 4700U along with 16 gigabytes of DDR4 3200 and a 512 gigabyte SSD, at least here in the UK. Obviously the models available to you may vary with region. Uh, elsewhere we have a Wi-Fi 5 or 802.11ac wireless card, not Wi-Fi 6 or 802.11ax. Um, again, Wi-Fi 6 is starting to come in, it would have been nice to have. 
it's not something I'm using yet, so I don't view it as the end of the world, but for future proofing, it might have been nice to see that in there, but it does tend to be a fairly expensive option. Uh, the webcam is 720p, and there is a micro SD card reader, not a full size SD card reader. So if you are taking this out and about, shooting on a camera and putting the card in, make sure even if your card camera takes full size SD cards, you've got an adapter and you can put micro SD into here, otherwise you're going to be carrying around the card reader with you. Moving on to input devices, and the keyboard feels good to me. Um, the key caps are all full size, chiclet style keys. They are plastic caps with a sort of translucent area to them because there is a backlight on this keyboard uh, and you can adjust that through two levels of brightness or off depending on your preferences. Um, so if you're working in a darker area you might want them on a low level of lighting or off completely to just save a small amount of power. Um, being a 13 inch laptop there's obviously no numpad and uh, you know their travel weight response all feels perfectly reasonable to me. Um, one thing that did bug me slightly is down this end you have your home page up page down end. Now with the 15 inch machine I've actually got really used to holding down the function key and using the arrow keys to page up page down and left and right for home and end and for whatever reason doesn't work on this laptop you have to use these dedicated buttons going between the two laptops it throws me off every time and I kind of wish they hadn't changed that I could do without those buttons there and a little more spacing uh, along the edges of the laptop uh, and there is also a fingerprint reader here for logging into Windows along with your Windows Hello camera support and everything else if you'd like to use that and the Fingerprint sensor is built in behind the alt and the arrow keys there. It does not function as a key, it's purely a reader. So again, if it was my choice, I'd have moved that out of the keyboard, perhaps down into the palm rest, brought in those arrow keys slightly, and deleted this row of keys and used the alt key. Just, I, I find that nicer and it would have given a bit more spacing around the keyboard. But, personal preference, I will get used to it and it's not the end of the world. The touchpad, uh, similarly, it's a plastic, not a glass coating on that. It uses the Windows Precision touchpad driver. Um, and again, compared to the 15 inch model, it feels a little cramped, obviously, because the laptop is smaller. <laughs> um, I will get used to that again. It works well in use. I, again, have no issues with that. The laptop does also support pen and stylus input. No pen is included, but I have, again, this, uh, I believe it is the HP pen with pressure sensitivity, which came with my 15 inch machine. Uh, others have reported that this works with the HP pen tilt. Uh, both of these are Ntrig enabled devices, they're battery powered. Um, and I will cut in some footage just of showing it with some applications. It supports pressure sensitivity and everything you would expect. Again, I am not a huge user of these. Uh, to actually answer some questions on the device, I had to first find mine and then find a battery for it. it takes quadruple A's in case you ever find yourself without one and didn't know quadruple A batteries exist. So looking at the thermal design of the laptop, air is drawn in through these vents on the base of the machine and then is and then exhausted through these two slots on the back of the laptop. I believe this one may be blanked and it's just coming out of this one and maybe they're just using this one to keep the machine looking symmetrical as there's a single heat sink and blower which comes through this side. People have asked on heat and noise of the machine and there are a number of different modes that you can run this laptop in using the HP command center um, so by default it uses what is called HP recommended. You also have a AC power only uh, performance mode where you can plug the laptop in and prioritize just pure performance which will in my experience peak performance is equal to the recommended mode when you've got short tasks um, but sustained performance tends to stay at that higher level. I will include a graph here uh, where we can see so on the HP recommended setting, we see that the first run gives us actually our best result in Cinebench. However, we then get a average, uh, which is a little bit below that. Uh, and 
what you find is you have this curve of performance where it starts at that maximum level, the second run dips, and then it will go to sort of a baseline uh, level of performance. We will touch again that in that in one of my battery tests. Um, the performance mode, basically, there's some performance variance just because Cinebench doesn't give identical results every time. Uh, this gets the APU running at up to almost 100 degrees, and I believe the performance mode is basically just trying to run it as fast as it can while keeping temperatures below that 100 degrees Celsius point. Uh, HP recommended hit a maximum of 94, or 95, uh, 94.6, and that was early in the run, um, where it was running at those higher boosts, and then as it got up to temperature, uh, it then sort of tailed off slightly into high 80s. There are also two other modes it can run at. You have Comfort, um, which locks the APU to 10 watts. Uh, generally it runs up to around 20 for short term, or 30 for very short term, 20 to, in recommended mode for slightly longer tasks, and then moves to its sort of targeted 15 watts. And if you select the comfort profile, it's trying to keep the APU temperature below 70 degrees to try and minimise the uh, base temperature of the laptop. So in doing this, you lose around 25% performance, but it will keep that base temperature lower and in theory should also increase battery life. Although because of just the amount of time that running battery tests takes and the fact that I want to get this video live because I've had a lot of people asking about it, I haven't been able to compare all the profiles on battery life. Uh, finally, you have quiet mode, which allows the APU to run a little hotter, up to about, in my test, it was giving uh, just below 87 degrees Celsius. And this gives slightly better performance than comfort. Again, it's targeting around 10 watts, but because it is uh, not just trying to keep that temperature as low as possible, it's just trying to keep the fan noise down. Um, it perhaps allows a little more use of boost clocks, so it gives, uh, what are we looking at, around about or a bit less than 10% performance increase over the comfort profile, um, but prioritises low noise for the temperature of the base of the machine. So those modes give you options for how you want to use the machine. It's particularly nice if, say, you're watching video on it uh, to have it in the quiet setting or if, you say, you're using it in a lecture hall and don't want to be creating excessive noise. Or if you're using the machine on your lap, putting it in comfort just means it's not going to heat up your legs so much um, at the expense of just running the fans a little louder. The control center tool is really simple. It's pre-installed on the machine or I believe you can install it uh, as a download off the HP website if you choose to clean install the machine. And it is one of those rare bits of pre-installed software that I would definitely keep on the machine and switch between modes as I'm using it. Moving on to the screen itself. And obviously it is a reflective screen. You're getting a nice view of my camera here mostly. Um, but this is, so 13, 13.3 inch diagonal, I believe. Uh, color gamut is reasonably good. It is 72% of NTSC for the colors. Um, and viewing angles, obviously in here you are getting quite a lot of reflection, but again, viewing angles really good. This is an IPS type display, so color accuracy should be reasonable. Color gamut, good for a laptop. Not as nice as say the 4K LED monitors I have here. Um, but for what it is, it gives a very nice display for a laptop. Uh, you also have the option of running it in a 40 hertz mode uh, to reduce power consumption because you're refreshing the screen less frequently. And if you are gaming on the machine, then you can enable FreeSync, which allows you to have a variable refresh to make game motion look smoother when it can't match that 60 frames per second or refresh rate and adjust the refresh rate to match the frame rate you're getting in game, at least to some extent. Now moving on to the battery and battery life, and the battery in this machine is obviously not user removable uh, without removing the base of the laptop. Again I have got a video showing how to do that and I will cut in some pictures of what this laptop looks inside and the battery itself. Uh, the battery is a HP BN03XL type lithium polymer battery, uh, rated to 51 watt hours by HP. 
This is fairly large for a 13 inch machine. It's obviously when you look at how much space it takes in the laptop, it's not on the level of something like the old MacBooks, uh, the 12 inch Retina MacBooks where you had a tiny mainboard and then just battery filling the whole thing. Um, but it is probably you know, a significant portion of the lower half of the machine. It's flanked on either sides by the speakers as we discussed earlier. And I've run my own tests with battery level monitoring tools that I created a few years ago, along with my own custom scenarios uh, for sort of web browsing and heavy usage of the machine. And these were conducted using the HP recommended performance profile, 50% screen brightness, 50% volume, although none of the tests other than Windows alerts played any real sound. Uh, wireless was enabled, but in mobile data mode to prevent updates from being downloaded in the background. And keyboard backlighting was enabled, and because the tests that I have sometimes simulate uh, keyboard inputs, they would come on occasionally, but after a few seconds of no input, the keyboard backlights do go out uh, if you are not typing. So first up we have our web browsing test, which runs through a loop of 10 web pages consisting of saved static sites, and CSS test content, uh, with the page changing every 10 seconds through an automatic forward between all the different pages. Uh, this gives constant usage throughout the test with no pauses or rests, and therefore is probably more intensive than real world usage, and was also measured running down the battery from 95 to 45% charge, so a 50% draw, which I've then extrapolated out to uh, give a decrease to 5% battery life purely just because, um, again, I have been asked a lot for this review and running multiple battery runs from you know, 99 to 0% charge was just going to be a long time to do that with only one unit available. And that gave me an approximate runtime of 9.5 hours. In real world usage, I wouldn't be surprised to see this go further where you aren't constantly loading new pages and obviously could be extended by switching to the quiet or particularly the comfort pro performance profile which limit power consumption. Uh, you could lower the screen brightness and so on. Um, HP give a battery life of up to 13 hours and 15 minutes on the page that was for this machine when I bought it and I can believe that for very light usage. Um, in reality you aren't constantly loading new pages for 10 hours. Um, you know, you do have pauses and rests and moments where you aren't doing anything. Uh, conversely, you may also not just be using one application continuously, so you may have... It's going to vary depending on your usage, obviously, but for this kind of use, I think it, getting near to 10 hours is realistic. I also tested the battery life uh, with the laptop under full load using a loop of Cinebench R15. Uh, running on an automated loop, uh, again with the program that I created, monitoring the battery level and performance throughout the test. And with this we can see with the APU running under near constant full load, the performance does drop off somewhat after 15 minutes, uh, going from a score of around 800 as the APU temperature is lower and is able to run higher boost clocks, we see sort of a gradual drop and then uh, falling into just under sort of 700 in Cinebench as the temperatures rose and then stayed there for the duration of the test. Um, overall, running it like this, the laptop life was around 2.5 hours. This would have been almost constantly drawing the maximum amount of power that the APU can provide. So again, not something you're likely to do unless you were using this, say, to you know, play a game on it for that length of time, in which case you may be best running it on AC and using the performance profile A to get better performance and B just not to risk running out of battery in the background while you're playing. Finally we also took a look at charging performance and using the supplied 65 watt charger from HP uh, again with the laptop running idle 50% display brightness and switched on so not optimal charging conditions because we could have just put the laptop to sleep plugged it into charge uh, so there is more power draw going on there because things are running um, but still a you know, reasonable state, you don't always put your laptop to one side to charge it, often you will plug it in and charge there. But as we can see from the graph, um, it took roughly in line with HP's claims to get a 50% charge in there. Going from 7% at the charge up to 50% took roughly, well, a little under 30 minutes. 
Uh, this is what HP claim on their site. They say it can charge 50% within 30 minutes and going by the data that I was able to get, that seems realistic. After it gets that 50% point, because rapidly charging batteries to full is generally not particularly good for them, you see the rate tails off. Um, so by the just under the hour mark, we're up to 75% charge. And to get all the way to 99%, um, I left it on for quite a long time and it never actually went to 100 because again, they really don't like absolutely filling the batteries. Um, it took one hour 50 to get to that 99% charge. Combined with the good battery life on this generally, uh, I don't see that as too much of an issue. If, in the same way you often now rapid charge your phone to top it up, you can put this on charge for half an hour, have you know, potentially five hours of battery life from that. Um, a lot of people have asked about charging via the USB-C port, and unfortunately I have not been able to confirm this. The HP page states USB power delivery support, but they don't specify whether that is for charging other devices via the USB-C port or for charging the laptop itself. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a USB PD charger. Um, it's not something that I use myself. And while I do have some USB-C chargers, I don't want to risk um, damaging the laptop by char plugging random phone chargers into the USB-C port. It should deal with it, but I don't. Not, since none of them are USB PD, it doesn't feel worth the risk to me. So overall, would I recommend the HP MV X360 30AY 0008NA? Well, I have to say I really like the machine. Um, the Renoir APU in it, the 4500U, very nice chip. The other components in it may make me wish that I had spent the extra money and got the 0009 version with the 16 gigs of RAM particularly the larger SSD and that 4700U processor. Um, part of the reason I didn't was that actually, in terms of testing things, I think I thought I wanted the 4500U, as I believe there'll be more people interested in performance of that. But there is a little bit of me that does regret not getting the higher spec model. So depending on your usage, this you know for most people this will be absolutely fine. Power users may well want who still want something thin and light may well want to look at spending the extra £200 to get that higher spec model. Otherwise though, I'm really pleased with it. You know, I like the screen, I like the keyboard, I like the touchpad, the pen support is nice to have, the convertible aspect of it is good, and overall it's a really nice laptop. It's certainly not the cheapest option around, but for the form factor, the build quality, um, the general look and feel of it, I think it's a really good option. Um, I hope you found this video useful. It really is my first attempt at doing a longer form review of this like this to camera. Uh, I generally don't sit in front of the camera a lot at all as people who subscribe to my channel will know. So do let me know what I could have done better, what else you would like to know about this machine because I will be doing my best to answer all the comments as fully as possible um, and may even run some additional tests to put on the video. Let me know what other laptops you would like to see tested because I am not averse to getting some more things in to try out and rotate around what I'm running. Um, and yeah, hit subscribe if you want to see more, like the video and just help us do more of this in future. Thanks for watching.